So joining me now is Peter Khalil. Uh, he's a congressional candidate in Washington's third district. I watch too much uh, football because I keep wanting to call him Peter Khalil Mack. Um, all right, uh, Peter, welcome to the Young Turks. How are you? Hey, Jank, uh, thank you for having me on here. I uh, really appreciate your being a loud progressive voice for us. Uh, no problem, brother. Uh, so uh, I wanna find out more about you and why you're running for Congress. But first, I wanna uh, get to know your district a little bit. Washington's sure. third district, uh, represented by a Democrat or Republican? Represented by a Republican, uh, Jamie Herra Butler for, uh, it's gonna be ten coming on 10 years now, and uh, we really need to flip this thing. And uh, what's going on over there? The state of Washington is generally considered to be progressive, but obviously it has pockets of conservative voters. Uh, how red is this district? So we are a, just about a 50-50 district with a little bit of a tip towards the red. Um, we are in the southwest corner of our district is Vancouver, Washington, the main city. We've got the uh, you know the healthcare, uh, the ports, uh, and uh, information technology and stuff like that. And then outside of Vancouver and Clark County, we have a primarily rural uh, you know seven other counties uh, represented in our district, and um, you know those do tend to swing red, but um, you know. Uh, everybody there, you know, wants the same things. They want uh, healthcare. Uh, they want uh, to be able to live a good life, uh, drink uh, clean water, and breathe clean air. Uh, and they want a government uh, that uh, is for them and not for the corporations. So, uh, Peter, if the district is that close, the it's going to be on a list uh, for the National Democrats. Uh, so, you, based on what I've read so far, appear to be pretty progressive. Uh, so they're not gonna like that. I'm curious what the uh, dynamic is for the Democratic Party uh, in that district. Well, you'd actually be surprised. Uh, so when you when you say they aren't gonna like that, it, you know, we're getting a really good reception uh, within the the, the the population. You know, I don't I don't go around saying, hey, I'm Peter Khalil, you know, in these rural areas, and I'm a, I'm a progressive Democrat. I, you know, I come and I say, you know, how long does it take you to get a ho get to a hospital? How much how much in medical bills do you have? Uh, you know, uh, what's happened to you? You know, a lot of a lot of these uh, counties have not recovered from the recession. Um, so we talk about the issues, and uh, you are correct that within the Democratic Party there is a split between the uh, the progressives and uh, I guess what you would call the moderates. Um, and you know I, I, I'm not interested in being in that fray. I'm, I'm interested in being above that fray. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's the people who are going to decide. It's not going to be the party here. Okay. Um, so about the voters, I'm not remotely surprised. But uh, you have in your plank, for example, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, anti-corruption. Uh, so those are not things that Pelosi gets excited by, and they're like, <laughs> "Oh, send the cavalry for Peter Khalil." That's right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're not. They're not going to be sending the cavalry. But the great thing is, there is no substitute for human engagement. There is no substitute for connecting directly with people, and that is what we're going to do. We're going to win this thing vote by vote. We're going to win this thing door by door, and we're going to win this thing event by event. Uh, and that's the only way we can do it. Um, you know. And that said, we are going to get a lot of good progressive endorsements. Uh, we are going to get a decent amount of money. Uh, but uh, the way that we are going to do this is good old fashioned politics, uh, good old fashioned retail politics. Uh, and we have to do this, I believe, because 2020, I think, is our last chance on a lot of things. Um, but you're right, cavalry isn't coming for us. Yeah, so you worked on Wall Street, Peter. Uh, what did you learn from that and, and what did you decide to do instead? So yeah, I worked. Uh, I worked for a big white shoe law firm, and I understand you're a lawyer as well. And uh, uh, so you, yep. you kind of know how it works. Um, from 2007 to 2010, I worked for a big uh, Wall Street law firm, and and my wife did too. And uh, I, I represented banks, and my wife was actually on a Madoff case. And what I saw there was um, stomach turning. Honestly, to be honest, uh, you know, you had these companies uh, betting for and against the same risky investments. Uh, you had companies, uh, banks, openly violating anti money laundering regulations. But you know the worst thing was, uh, you know, two really bad things. You know, one that they didn't really care. They didn't care about these main streets being decimated. Uh, and the second thing was, and and you know, this is why I'm running on a very very strong anti-corruption platform, is that they would contribute millions and millions of dollars, either directly or indirectly, to political campaigns to make sure that our representatives voted the way they wanted them to vote, not the way the people wanted them to vote. And that's why I left that uh, after only three years. I left Wall Street, and so did my wife, and we moved out to the land of uh, my wife's upbringing up here in Southwest Washington. Uh, 
uh, and uh, you know, uh, turn over a new leaf, became a mediator and arbitrator. Uh, my wife's a nonprofit lawyer, a uh, victim's rights lawyer out in Portland. And uh, you know, we decided that that we were going to work to make people's lives better. You know, I did half of my work for free for the last few years. Uh, of course, uh, you know, my my uh, my law school did. Uh, pay off my student loans in in uh, in return, and my wife has been a nonprofit lawyer, uh, you know, ever since uh, we worked out here or, or, or came out here, uh, and um, you know, the the purpose of life, I believe, is service. Um, I think the legacy that I want to leave behind is the legacy of improving as many people's lives as possible. So, Peter, um, you do have a strong anti-corruption stance, but. Tell, tell folks what it is. So what would you do mainly uh, to get rid of that corruption? Because you know when uh, I remember the famous moment when Anderson Cooper, at least it's famous to me, when Anderson Cooper asked in the Brooklyn debate back in 2016 yeah. to Bernie Sanders, do you think the money that Hillary Clinton took from donors affected her votes? And he was too damn polite to say yes. When you know and I know and you saw it with your own eyes, that's the whole point of the money, whether it's going to Republicans or Democrats. Yeah. So, what would you do about it? You know what? It's going to be a it's going to be a hard climb. Here's the thing: we do need to overturn Citizens United in some way, uh, and short of getting another court, we need a, a constitutional amendment. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, the states can you know government can regulate the time, place, and manner of uh, you know of of political donations of speech. You know, I don't know how you know money has been. We've decided that money is speech, so uh, you know the government can regulate the time, place, and manner, so we can severely restrict uh, contributions to to uh, to political campaigns. But here's the other thing. Um, well, you know, here, here's my, my if I had my druthers, um, I, we would have publicly funded elections. Uh, we would have elections that didn't last more than a few months, uh, and um, we would have ranked choice voting. Um, that that is my ultimate goal. Uh, but short of that, short of that constitutional amendment, short of a constitutional convention, we really do need to limit the time, place, and manner. Uh, we need to figure out ways to put obstacles to to these um, these big donations, uh, and um, we we need to give the FEC a bit more teeth in, in enforcing. The you know rules against concealment things like that. So um, you know we, we got to do what we can within the constraints of the Constitution. But ultimately, we we do have to change the Constitution because money should not ever have been uh, determined to be speech. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. Uh, public financing can be done through things like democracy dollars, where you empower yeah. uh, citizens to to contribute to politicians, uh, so that you even the score between the money they have and the money the that uh, the Koch brothers or even Soros has, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you uh, do an amendment to end private financing altogether, because yeah. uh, otherwise politicians work for private interests. So it's a great plank, exactly right. Um, so uh, a lot of controversy about whether Medicare for all is popular. Now, if you look at the polling, there isn't actually much controversy. Even when they right. skew all of the polls against Medicare for all, it still does pretty well. If you tell people what it actually is, I've seen a poll as high as 78%. But yep. they will say to you, Peter, what are you doing? Running in a purple district that has a Republican incumbent on Medicare for all, uh, the voters will hate that. They love big private insurance. <laughs> So what are you seeing from the voters? The, the voters do not love big private insurance. Uh, whether you're rural and Republican, whether you're a progressive Democrat, uh, people are drowning in medical debt. I see people every day who are having to make the choice between bankruptcy and getting better, between housing and healthcare, and between uh, between food and healthcare. That decision should never have to be made by a single person in the most wealthy country on earth. And when you frame it that way, and when you frame it uh, you know, uh, as something that affects uh, people's everyday life, there is no more Republican or Democrat. You know, I've had people uh, who support Trump agree with me that we need single payer health care, that we need uh, to acknowledge that it's it, whether or not it's popular, it's a moral imperative in the richest country on earth for health care to be a right, plain and simple. Uh, absolutely. Now, one other thing that uh, is on your plank that isn't on everybody's is rural internet. So, uh, and I do see that sometimes from candidates in Kansas and Montana, and you're of course in in some of the rural areas of Washington. What what's going on there? What for us uh, big city slickers? Yeah. <laughs> what's the situation with the internet that makes it such a driving issue for all of you candidates in those areas? 
So you go out into these rural areas, and so we've got a lot of rural counties, Pacific, Skamania, Lewis County, Klickitat County. And what you see time and time again is that people are unable to access the global marketplace, that businesses are unable to access their customers, that in, uh, there is no incentive for businesses to invest in these rural areas because broadband internet does not exist in those areas. Uh, you know, it may exist in some pockets of those areas, but overwhelmingly, when I ask people outside of Clark County, what is your biggest need? They just need to be connected to the world. Uh, you know, they're still operating on very, very slow speeds. It's 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 hard to sell things online. It's hard to be a corporation and communicate with your your customer base, uh, even process payments if you don't have internet access. And the same goes also for the the uh, the electrical grid out. The electrical grid out there needs to be uh, modernized. Uh, we are in our rural areas. Uh, decades behind. And that's why it's an important issue to, to these people out in our rural areas, because it is really hindering uh, the economy there. They have not recovered from the recession, and this is part of the reason why. The other reason that I'm pushing for um, rural broadband internet is because we're at the crossroads, we're in the crosshairs of a lot of investment on uh, behalf of fossil fuel companies, right? So they want to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure. And what I'm trying to say is, no, we don't need this fossil fuel infrastructure. We need the infrastructure of the future, and rural broadband is part of that infrastructure. So what I'm saying is if we build rural broadband, we satisfy the need for infrastructure and union jobs out in these areas that haven't recovered from the recession, and we give people access to the global marketplace. So it serves a dual purpose, and that's why it's so important out here. Yeah, I'm really glad I asked, because I had always assumed that it was mainly for Netflix. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, seriously though, I had assumed that it was mainly for access to information, which yeah. is critically important. Uh, but I didn't realize it, that because I don't live in one of those areas that it's also really important if you wanna run a business. How yep. the hell are you gonna sell anything online if you can't go online? And exactly. so, yeah, that's the modern economy, no question. So it's imperative uh, to the economies in those areas as well. And I'm glad you're fighting for it. Before we let you go super quick, is the doll behind you uh, next to the Peter Khalil sign of Ruth Bader Ginsburg? That is my wife's Ruth Bader Ginsburg action figure, and don't call it a doll, all right? It's an action figure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, big ups to the Khalil family. Okay, <laughs> KhalilforCongress.com, this is actually the last day of the quarter. It's actually very relevant to donate, especially on a day like today, uh, fighting against anti-corruption. KhalilforCongress.com slash donate slash volunteer. All the links are always down below if you're watching later on YouTube or Facebook. Thanks for watching this free clip of the Young Turks. Don't forget to become a TYT member today. For more exclusive content, join now at tyt.com slash join.